I'm Mike. I'm Jason. This is Snake Envy. We, or I should say I, had, and a friend of ours, had a mite scare recently. Well, we actually had mites. And we want to make perfectly clear for Jason's customers, they did not come from here. Um, we have figured out which breeder they came from. And tell us a little bit about the importance of quarantine when you get a new snake. And what do you recommend for quarantine? Quarantine, I would, you know, I would still just use a regular old, you know, tub. But you should isolate these animals. Like when you bring animals in your, your facilities or snake room or whatever you may have, you should have an area where you can keep your snakes, a separate room preferably, um, watch over them for a month, at least a month, and just watch them, look at their bowel movements, look at the bedding, look for mites, it, just any possible... Anything you know. that might be out of sorts. Yeah. And I would even recommend during the quarantine period, keep them on paper towels. Yeah. And that's a smart idea. I mean, uh, that's... A, you should do that anyway. Yeah. For sure. Uh, just for the quarantine period. Not even newspaper paper towels because they're, they yeah. don't want the ink. White paper towels, no pattern, no design, preferably just plain white. And we'll show you in a minute why those white paper towels are so important where mites are concerned. But parasites in general, whether they're intestinal or whether they're uh, intestinal parasites, we commonly just refer to as worms, um, but they come in a variety of forms. If a snake were to have a virus or something else, you might find that a snake is not keeping down meals or it's vomiting, uh, diarrhea. Or weird, funky stools. Yeah, stools that just don't look right, and we're going to talk about that here as well. But we're going to talk about both. We're going to talk about intestinal parasites, and then we're going to talk about external parasites, which mites are. But so are fleas, so are ticks. Uh, in the wild, if you bring a snake from the wild, it could have ticks, it could have mites. Here in arid Utah, we don't worry about those things quite as much, but in some parts of the country, a snake, you know, a snake can be I covered in I feel like the snakes. further south you go, the more... Yeah. Uh, the more humid. More bugs and yep. crap. But long story short, we identified where the mites came from. This friend of ours had, had purchased a couple snakes from another breeder, uh, we had some wild snakes that we had also collected and he and I traded a couple of those wild snakes. They had nothing to do with the mites except the new snakes that he had brought in. I had quarantined the wild ones, he had quarantined his new ones, but the timing worked out that when he and I traded a couple of those wild snakes, he gave mites to me, and he already had them. So, you know, the, the details are irrelevant, but that's how it happened. And we've narrowed down what breeder they came from. Obviously, we're not going to talk about who and all that. But we do know where the mites came from. They did not come from here. Um, but we're going to talk about this because this can happen to anybody. And it's a big stress. It is. I have a friend that stresses over this. And yeah. yeah. It's, it's not it's not I mean it's nothing to laugh about. It's no. But it's nothing to be like it's not like devastating. It shouldn't be devastating. You, right. you can control this, you can get after it. I'm always just observant when I'm cleaning my cages. Like Yeah. You know. Yeah. Everybody or, should stools, be. anything that looks weird, you know. Um, if you have snakes shipped in, if you attend reptile expos, even a breeder that does not have mites himself and has never had mites, while vending at a reptile show, if the guy next to you brings mites to the show, those mites can make their way. And if you don't sell a snake, or even if you do sell a snake, I mean, this is how they spread. Um, and this is the biggest reason people don't 
breeders don't want to let you hold all their snakes yes. at expos. Yes, you can have because them on of your this, hands. Yeah. I got them that way back in 2002, 2003. Yeah. I got mites because they let people handle snakes yeah. at a show. Or breeders will have you hand sanitize and do things before handling snakes. And that's part of it. You know, you'll notice them on your hands while you're doing that. Um, for the purposes of today's video, we ground up some black pepper. We are using black pepper to simulate mites, but we're going to show you how to look for them and the difference in looking for them on paper towels versus actual substrate. It's night and day <laughs> trying to spot them. It's tricky to spot them on your snakes, but you can. Yeah. Well, um, another sign is to snakes can get irritated by the mites and they'll soak in the water and drown them. Yep. And so when you're changing water, look for black specks. Yep. You know? And sometimes it's nothing. Most of the time it's nothing, but you know. Right. But, you know, I every time I see a black speck, I check it. Yep. Because Absolutely. Now, technically, they can come in three different colors, snake mites. Now, the interesting thing about mites, they prefer a specific host. There's a whole variety of mites. We have mites on us, and these mites aren't drinking our blood. They're eating the dander from our skin and things like that, but we have mites on us. Um, they're microscopic. We can't see them. Uh, my wife keeps chickens. We also keep beehives. Uh, chickens can get mites, and chickens dust bathe. They dig holes in the dirt and they dust bathe to get, keep the mites off. We treat our beehives spring and fall for mites. People are off talking about bees lately and how bees are struggling. When it comes to domesticated bees and commercial honey bees, the number one risk to their health is a mite. And if bees go into winter, with mites you've got two stresses you've got a mite drinking their blood at the same time they're trying to conserve energy and food and it's cold and they're having to expend energy to stay warm and the combination of those two will wipe out a bee colony so mites are a big deal but as Jason said one of the things we want to emphasize with mites it's no different than mosquitoes or ticks the tick and the mosquito, they don't hurt us or other animals for the most part by drinking our blood. There would have to be thousands of them over a long period of time to kill us just by drinking our blood. It's that they spread disease. Snake mites are no different. You would have to basically ignore mites for a long period of time and let them go crazy in order to kill a snake just from the parasitic uh, aspect would, of it. Your snake would have to be totally neglected for exactly months, like out of time you would. But it can happen and yeah. neos are more susceptible obviously than adults. If, an, if a parasitic infection on the neos is, and they're taking their blood they can obviously be impacted quicker. But it's important to note that because it's a big deal and you want to deal with the mites. You don't want to let them go crazy in your snake room. But at the same time, you can get ahead of them. Your snakes aren't going to die in a week. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get ahead of them and we're going to go through that. But the real risk is that they're carrying some bloodborne virus that they picked up from somebody else's collection and that that is then going to spread through your collection so that is why it's urgent because they could be carrying disease um, so we're going to cover two different methods of dealing with mites and typical to our channel you're a breeder you have much more risk than I do uh, financial risk and otherwise you're going to talk about the one sure way to deal with mites. I'm going to talk about a way that I prefer that requires more work on my part but is much safer for my animals. Uh, just like with the bees, when we treat our bees with formic acid to deal with those mites, the treatment kills bees. So every time you treat, you're going to lose some of them. 
Okay. And that's the other reason you got to be careful in the fall, is that if you deplete too many of your bees with the mite treatment, they can't regenerate in time for winter, get their population back up, mm. and stay warm. The same risks apply here because the treatments for snake mites can actually kill snakes. Uh, it can also cause neurological damage. For neos, I do not recommend chemical treatments, period. Um, but I don't have four or five hundred neos <laughs> to have to deal with. So you can talk about whether you would risk chemical treatments on neos, but neos can suffer, particularly neos, can suffer neurological damage and they can suffer death from the chemical applications. So I do think it's important to talk about the fact that there's options. So let's start with you as a breeder. You find out you've got mites, you've narrowed it down to one or two snakes. Uh, what are you doing at that point? At that point, I'm going to get a new tub to keep them in, and I'm going to isolate them from the, the rest of the population. Um, I use, this is what I've used, and there's many different brands of this. The key ingredient in, in this is permectin, and this, this brand here is from Walmart. Um, to treat ticks, mosquitoes, mites even, it says on here. Um, you spray it on your clothes. And... It's meant to be a repellent, but it's it's an insecticide. Yeah. Um, um, and I've had to use something similar to this when I went to Peru. Yeah. Because of the bugs or so. You, yeah. you put, you, put you, you know, you spray your all your clothes down um, and let them dry out for days. Um, but this spray, all, what I will do with it, I will spray a fine and even spray on a tub. I'll spray it, coat it, even the outside. Um, let that dry for at least 24 hours. Plus I spray the paper towel line, the, pa the paper towel that goes in there. Spray both sides of it, let that dry for 24 hours. And then, supposedly it's safe. <laughs> and I've it's been forever since I've had to do this. but um, And the majority of the time it will be safe. And it is. And for adult snakes, it's much safer I have than, lost, than with me. I have lost a snake because I did not yes. wait 24 hours. I got some snakes in, shipped in, noticed mites right away, isolated them, put them in the, the room, um, the isolation room. But... Um, also, on top of this, letting it dry for 24 hours, I don't give the snake water in there for a couple days either. And so I try to keep the water out of there as much as possible during this time. Make sure they're hydrated. They can get water every two, three days, you know. But I don't think it's, it's really, if this gets, this chemical gets in the water and they digest it, it's not good. Yeah, and even, so this is the risky part. Yeah, and you even want to limit, you know, it getting on the snakes. If the snakes were to tip over the water and then crawl through the water, I mean, theoretically, you're re-wetting. So it's no different than bleach or other chemicals that you might use to clean a tub. There's going to be residue left behind, but you're letting it dry. Yeah, and then the, and the purpose of spraying the enclosure is when the mite falls off or jumps off or whatever, however it does gets off the snake and it touches that paper towel or tub, it kills it. So and also eggs. It's, it, you know, any eggs that are laid are going to get killed by that, that insecticide as well. And so, yeah, you'll do this. Two weeks later, you'll do ivernectin. And there, there's also another chemical you can use in addition to uh, permectin. Tell us about that one. Ivernectin. Oh, cl trichloroform. Trichloroform. And we are not purposely going to recommend any percentages or any dosages or any strengths. Right. Go to a veterinary website, talk to your vet, get recommendations in terms of the strength. 
The other thing to keep in mind, these, so these chemicals are in a variety of products. This is actually technically uh, a, a repellent, but it contains the exact same ingredient that veterinarians recommend you spray into the enclosure to treat for mites, and it's the same percentage yeah. dose. But you'll want to use either of those two chemicals initially, and then two weeks later, ivermectin. And of course, ivermectin made news during COVID, um, but it, it's been used as an anti-parasitic for decades. And that's given orally. Exactly. Um, but it also comes in a form that you can treat your enclosures with. So that's the chemical treatment now in your case you were saying you just swap out the tub and you have the ability to do that you're going to clean the tub that had the mite maybe you even discard it if you can yeah probably a good idea yeah and i would say that goes for any organic material that the mites were on so substrate you use uh art you know cardboard hides and plastic water bowls they're all disposable toss them. If you have live plants in an enclosure, oh, everything. toss them. <laughs> if you have wood or rope in your enclosure, toss them. Don't even mess. Uh, just get rid of them. Just... Um, the only thing I keep are hard plastic hides and water bowls, and we'll show you uh, what we're going to use to clean those. But if you're talking about a PVC enclosure or a glass enclosure, the two methods, whether it's chemical or my method, are going to start the same. And that's basically treat that enclosure as if you're doing a full enclosure breakdown. So you're tossing all the substrate, you're tossing any disposable things, any natural things, and then you're going to wash thoroughly the inside of the enclosure. Some people recommend like a quarter to a half inch of really hot water in the bottom of the enclosure, assuming it's waterproof, and a few drops of dish soap get a little suds going in that. And dish soap changes the viscosity of surfaces, makes them slick, um, but it also creates a, a surface tension that will knock the mites under the water, keep them from floating, and drown them and then any eggs would be drowned as well. And you want to spray thoroughly the sides of the enclosures, like wet everything down really well, funnel everything to the bottom. Um, some people recommend diluted bleach after that, but basically however you would treat your enclosure when you're doing your monthly or three monthly or six monthly complete teardown, that's what you want to do when you see mites. That's always going to be step one. Um. One question for your um, method: Do you uh, actually do you treat the snake? Yes. As well. Yes. Do you wipe it down with soapy water or? Yeah. Okay. So. So yeah. So let's talk about the alternative method, which I use. I only have ten snakes. If the mites were starting to spread in this room and you're starting to see a couple over here and a few over there yeah. the amount of work that you would have to undergo with my method would be ridiculous um, I pretty much if, if I had a collection this size I would use chemicals uh, on everything but Neos because I only have 10 enclosures that I have to deal with I do what I do so let's walk through that. So the first step is the same. Total enclosure clean out. Um, if I do have a young snake in a tub, for example, I would take that tub straight to the bathtub and I would get it in there, get it completely out of the snake room. It's not easy to take an entire enclosure, you know, and move it out of the room. I just thought of this. So clean it out just like I would a full enclosure clean out. That's step one. I just thought of this, but like, could you steam that enclosure? You could. Uh, well, some some help, people recommend it? hot water, like as hot as you can stand, um, so that you're using a combination of hot water and drowning. Uh, some people recommend follow it up with bleach. I prefer not to use bleach. I use Simple Green, 
Simple Green is sudsy and it's kind of thick compared to water. And so I coat the sides from the top down with Simple Green and I let it pool in the bottom of the enclosure. I spray it completely down. I'm drowning anything that's in there and I'm letting it sit for at least two minutes. So basically while, while the enclosure is soaking, now I take my hides and my water bowls to the bathtub and I'm gonna use dish soap. I'm gonna use a dish brush. I'm gonna wet that brush. I have a brush that I use just for my decor. I'm gonna wet that brush. I'm gonna put a big glob of dish soap on the hide and I'm gonna use the brush to basically leave a really thick coating of soap everywhere on every square inch of water bowls and hides and then I'm going to let those sit in the bathtub with that thick layer of soap so again I'm smothering anything that's on them and I'm making it really difficult for the mite to hang on if, if it's on that stuff then I'm going to go back while that's sitting for two minutes and I'm going to wipe out the enclosure and I'm looking for mites every step of the way. And again, we're gonna show you some video using ground pepper of what they look like. I mean, again, they can be gray, they can be red, they can be black, but the majority of the time they're black. And it really does look like pepper, <laughs> a black pepper sitting on your paper towel or on your snake. Now, here's the key. Because I'm only using dish soap, what some people do is they will use a tub, they'll put maybe a half inch of water in the tub, they will put some drops of dish soap, and they'll put the snake in that soapy water. Here's what I do. I'm gonna use a thick coating of, of soap, and I'm gonna cover my entire snake, pretend my finger is a snake, in soap. Now, I'm being careful with the eyes, I'm being careful with the mouth, I'm paying particularly attention to the belly scales, mites can hide under there, the loose neck skin, but I'm getting all that really good. That thick layer of soap, I'm then going to put the snake in that quarter to half inch of water, but that's after completely covering the snake in soap. So this way I can treat the snake and I can deal with the enclosure. I'm smothering mites, eggs, anything that might be on the snake. The interesting thing while you're doing this, while you're coating the snake, you'll see the mites. Oh, those are crawling on <laughs> You'll see them on your hand. Yeah, you'll see bad. them in the tub. Um, so I'm following up a really thick layer of soap by then putting the snake in a quarter to a half inch of water while he's covered in soap. And the combination of those two things. Then I'm gonna go clean out my enclosure, do this, do that, while the snake is soaking for a couple minutes and while the mites are having opportunity to drown. Then when I come back to the snake, I rinse off the snake under the shower head, warm water. Rinse the snake off really well. And again, you'll, you'll see some mites while you're doing that, but they'll be dead. You won't see them moving. Uh, now, when I go back to the enclosure with the snake, it's only paper towels, it's only hides, and it's only a water bowl. No decor, no nothing, even if it's plastic and artificial, no plants, nothing that mites could hide in, and nothing that mites could lay eggs on. So it's two hides and a water bowl, that's it. Now, I repeat that process in two weeks. But in between, you're probably wondering why, why I have packing tape. In between, I am going through twice a day and tearing off a little bit of packing tape. And any mites that I see on the paper towel, whether they look dead or alive, I am picking them up. And so I'm physically removing mites from the enclosure twice a day during that two week period and you're not always going to see them and again the goal is I want to get rid of physically as many mites as I can so that they don't have a chance to reproduce 
And so it might sound silly, but even if I just see one mite on a paper towel, dead, alive, I'm getting it. And the reason I'm doing that is that mite, for all I know, is about to lay eggs. Um, maybe that mite already reproduced. I don't know. So I'm physically picking up mites off the paper towels twice a day for two weeks. Uh, I'm checking every enclosure. Now in this particular case of mites, it was limited to those two snakes. It never spread because I did this. Uh, the reason I discovered the mites, by the way, one of the snakes shed. And I hadn't seen any mites prior to the shed. Even in the wild, uh, obviously snakes shed as they grow, but one of the benefits of shedding is that you also shed ticks, mites, anything that might be parasitic. So quite often you'll notice a mite infestation right after <laughs> the shed. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where did these come from? Um, but at the end of the two weeks, I'm going to clean the snake and do a full uh, clean out on the enclosure. At least twice a week and probably three times a week, I'm changing the paper towels completely, whether the snake pooped or not. Um, because again, the mites, when they're first born and very, very, very tiny, they are very tiny. You can see them, but it's hard. As they get bigger, they're much easier to spot. Um, so I'm also cleaning out full paper towel change out. And then I'm looking at the bottom of the enclosure using my tape if I see any mites left behind as I took out the paper towels. A couple days after you soap your snake and clean it off, you'll see dead mites in the enclosure. But occasionally you'll see live ones as well. At the end of the two weeks, I repeat the whole process. And then from that point forward, in my experience and in this particular case, the mites were pretty much gone. I discovered a straggler here and there. I kept them on paper towels for a full three, four weeks after I did all this. And occasionally I would see a straggler and pick it out with the tape. And then eventually the mites are gone and they're not coming back. So both methods can be effective but this method is a lot of work. It's a lot more, less invasive as well. But it's also entirely safe. I'm not using anything that can harm the snake. And for Neos, in my opinion, that's key. But again, if I had three or 400 ne <laughs> Neos following hatching, I, what would you do? Would you feel forced to use chemicals just because of the volume and take your chances? Maybe. Like, I haven't ever had to deal with it or yeah. think about it, or, but, yeah. But the important thing is know there's an option. Know there's a safe option for dealing particularly with neos. All right, let's talk about intestinal parasites, worms. Um, you have two snakes recently where you suspect worms. And why, why do you suspect that, first off? Um, just funny stools a lot of yeah. times. Um, sometimes regurging can be an indicator, too. Um, yeah, you, I, I always love, and it's harder when it's dried out, right? Um, but when that, that bowel movement's fresh, and it, sometimes you see that, like, cottage cheesy like that's not good and, like that white yeah. lumpy like you, know, you see anything unusual lumpy's not good stringy is not good like instead of a clump of yeah. poop if it's kind of long strands that's not good um, I have one wild snake in my collection one wild cot snake in my collection I think she was about a year old when I collected her she was still very small but her poops from day one were stringy and thin and they just didn't look right. And I took a fecal sample to the vet. Vet found the parasites. The vet then gave me uh, the medications I needed. I had to bring the snake in and weigh the snake. And then the vet gave me the correct dosage. Um, so what is your plan? preventatively to deal with this? 
Um, I will use a, I will use a product called Flagyl. Um, what it does is wipes out the bacteria in the digestive system. Now, there's good and bad bacteria in digestive systems uh, in animals, um, but if you get one that's bad, you're gonna, you know, I'll flagell it. I'll get the correct dose. I'll weigh the snake. I'll do the correct dosage, um, and you'll treat the animal orally once uh, treat it once and then two weeks later you'll follow up with another dose and um, what that does will it'll just wipe out the bad bacteria in there um, one thing you can do there's a product called and it's, I have it over here on the shelf call it's called Nutribac and that stuff you can it's just a powder it's you can't OD your animal on it it's totally safe it's just Get your animal, your rodent wet. I put a little sprinkle of water on there. I'll sprinkle some of that Nutribac on there. What that Nutribac does, it has three good bacteria for the digestive system. So it really puts that good bacteria back into the animal's digestive system. And if it's a mild case of whatever is going on in the snake, sometimes you can just use Nutribac and these these this stuff is so cool it um these uh these enzymes will force all the bad bacteria out and overcrowd it and push all the bad stuff out and then just leave good stuff and so sometimes you don't even need to treat your snake if it's a mild case right you can just use Nutribac so totally safe flagell you better be pretty accurate with that you know it's a chemical it's a yeah and again we're not going to recommend dosages and they vary depending on the weight of the snake and place it came know. from yeah yeah and one thing that most veterinary offices will do is allow you to bring in a fecal sample so you don't you know they can actually look at the fecal prior to even examining a snake or deciding it's usually pretty inexpensive 25 30 dollars to do a fecal and then at that point you know they'll want to get a weight on the snake um, and then there's a variety of medications they can prescribe based upon what specific parasite you have uh, and so the treatments will vary a little bit but what we are going to show you is how to administer an oral medication to a snake we are not using the actual medication we're using water um, but we're going to demonstrate for you why is it so important to do it correctly. Yeah, um, and obviously the first thing that comes to mind, you don't want to harm the animal. And so, and man, sometimes the snake wants to bite and sometimes it won't open that mouth or nothing. So, yeah, you know, and so you got to be, be careful. Tricky. Yeah, so... But keep in mind, the glottis that the snake breathes through faces forward. So if you come in right from in the front. front, there's a potential you're going to drown your snake with the medication by having it go into the glottis. So you always want to come in from the back corner of the mouth and kind of aim the medication down toward the throat. Snakes also don't swallow the way we do. Um, they don't really have a sphincter in their throat, and they don't really, you know, if you think about it, they use their teeth and their jaws to get the prey back to a point where muscles can then grab it and take it the rest of the way. So you kind of want to aim the medication back into the throat, and then those muscle contractions take it down to the stomach. And you want to go slowly. There's no, you know, little by little by little you get it in, and, and uh, but never go from the front. And there's other medications too, and um, we probably won't dive deep into them because they're uh, less often we needed. Um, yeah. Panic here is one of them. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ivernectin is another one. And that's where vets can give you advice. Uh, if you actually have a fecal done, you'll know exactly what parasite you're dealing with. Um, so let's show you how to dose 
using a syringe, uh, a snake, orally. Helps to have two people doing this where you can control the snake a little better. We're using a syringe and Jason's going to go into the back corner of the mouth and then kind of aim it down the throat and then slowly. Look at that. And that's how easy. I've done this a lot. So. The, uh, keep in mind, the medications that you're typically using, they're typically foamy. Um, they're not a straight liquid typically. And so that foam, you just kind of ease it in. Sometimes you'll have it coming out the side of the mouth. You'll hold up, put more. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you don't get it in the right spot. Yeah. Did you see how easily that the mouth opened when you get that corner? That yeah. was slick. So. so that's it. Pretty easy. The key is just placement. You always want to go to that back corner and kind of aim it down the throat if you go in forward. As we said, kind of a risk. You could drown your snake, actually. Yep. Yeah. He did pretty well. Jason probably didn't need my help. He's done this a lot. But it does help uh, if you've got one person kind of hanging onto the body sure. while, while he's working up at the, at the face. It's safer, too. Um, it's animal. safer. You can also kind of tuck the, uh, the body of the animal under your arm, have the head under control. But, um, but it really helps kind of make it a two-person job. So we have given you some advice on both intestinal and external parasites all right quick addendum to this video so if we're standing or sitting in a different place or if we're wearing <laughs> different stuff we're filming this after we did most of the filming about mites and parasites so question for you have you ever heard about using mites predatory mites to deal with snake mites i've never heard of this I had not either. And after we did our filming, just coincidentally, I saw a discussion on a fa Facebook group and there were people from Europe in the group. And I guess this is a very common way of dealing with snake mites in Europe. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, and this is the same principle as what you, you do in a garden. Um, we have purchased in our for our fruit trees in our garden ladybugs. We've purchased praying mantis egg pods, and you put them up in a tree yeah. and they hatch. And the ladybugs, man, they went to town. We had an aphid out outbreak on our fruit trees, and in two weeks, <laughs> I mean, the ladybugs <laughs> just went to town. So it's the same principle. You're using predatory insects to wipe out bad insects. And in this case, the predatory mites are not parasitic, so they don't care about your snake. Your snake is too big, obviously, for them to eat, so they go after the snake mites. When the snake mites are gone, they die off, and apparently that takes a couple weeks after all the food's dried up. And the eggs hatch, rehatch. Yeah, they, you know, and then they die off. Very now, interesting. but here's the question. In a room like this, 500, <laughs> you know, five to seven hundred snakes at any given time what do you think about the idea of unleashing you know insects all throughout this room now granted i'm assuming they would stay for the most part in the enclosures but does that bug you at all the idea that you're going to have thousands of mites in order to control the bad ones um and is that preferable to chemicals and you know this I mean, it'd be maybe weird to release bugs into your house. This isn't a house here. Uh, um, and if it was like a major infestation of snake mites, like, I, I would maybe be up to that. Like, that sounds very interesting. I love the idea because there's no insecticides. There's no chemicals. Yeah, and that's safe. why we use ladybugs, yeah, against our aphids, because we didn't want to use, we didn't want to spray all our fruit trees with insecticides. So, and I have to say, the ladybugs, it was impressive. So, please let us know in the comments if this is something you've done, and if you have experience with using predatory mites against snake mites, because I think this is brilliant. And I looked on Amazon, about 40 bucks, 
for a hobbyist to get enough that would definitely get the job done in a hobbyist snake room. For you, I mean, it might cost a little more, but um, they're available on Amazon. Wow. You I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, you can have them shipped in. So. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So please let us know if you've uh, if you have experience. Thanks. Thanks.